Hello there, Leo listeners. Cara here from leolisting.com, where I help advanced English learners fall back in love with their favourite films and TV series by helping them to break free from the subtitles. So, to finish off this month on personal development as it applies to listening, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work on the speech of one of the most famous personal development experts out there, Brene Brown, who's famous for her books and talks um, all about vulnerability, courage, um, imperfection. And what we're going to do is I'm going to compare how she speaks in a TED talk with how she speaks when she's in natural, spontaneous conversation. And this is to really show you the difference between the two, because I'm really sick of people telling uh, people like you learning English, well, just watch a TED Talk, or watch a TED Talk because there's an interactive transcript. This is... This is reducing listening and learning and understanding to the tools and not to what you actually need. Because I would only recommend TED Talks if you really need to understand that kind of um, academic monologue because you have to understand speeches or because you have to understand presentations at work or because you have to do public speaking yourself. That's when you should use TED Talks. Or if you're just interested in the topic, you can use TED Talks. Or you can use my tips to spice up the TED Talks to make them a bit more difficult and make them a bit closer to um, sort of spontaneous, natural speech. Um, because ultimately, if you're, you know, what you should listen to depends on what your goals are. And if you want to understand native speakers when they're talking fast, then you need to listen to um, resources where you have native speakers talking fast. If you want to understand a particular series, you need to watch that series. Don't waste your time watching TED Talks if they're not relevant. So I really want to reinforce that point today by showing you how Brene's speech changes from the TED Talk to when she's interacting spontaneously in an, in an interview. So that's what I'm walking you through today. So we're starting off with her TED Talk on listening to shame. And in the first minute of this TED Talk, which is what we're going to work on, she actually talks about um, the TED Talk here on the right, the power of vulnerability. So she talks about what happened after she gave that talk. So we're going to listen to some sections and I'm going to walk you through what's happening and the features of um, academic monologues like TED Talks. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my TEDx Houston talk. I woke up the morning after I gave that talk with the worst vulnerability hangover of my life. And I actually didn't leave my house for about three days. Okay, I've left the subtitles up just to make life easier. So interestingly, when she first starts this talk at about 18 seconds, she says, I'm going to, but in a really fast, like squashed down way, and it sounds more like I'm a, I'm a. So that's more conversational. And this doesn't shock me because Brene Brown is someone who talks in quite a conversational, informal way um, often. So, you know, that's fair enough. Afterwards, though, um, in, this, in these first um, few seconds, she's using a lot of deliberate pauses for effect. So this is what people do when they're giving these kind of monologues, these speeches. Um, so she says, you know, I woke up the morning after I gave that talk, then there's a big pause with the worst vulnerability hangover. So there are even pauses between the words, pause of my life. So for kind of dramatic effect, she she makes these pauses. And then there's another one, and I actually didn't leave my house. In fact, there's a pause in the middle there for about three days. So she's using these pauses for effect, and we can tell that she's prepared the speech She's not using any of the, the disfluency features that we hear in English. These are not pauses to help her think about what she's going to say next. These are pauses for dramatic effect so that the audience um, understands and retains the message. Now, even though she's speaking uh, at a talk and it's a bit more formal and we have this monologue style, it doesn't mean that some sounds don't disappear or don't link. Um, for instance, when she says that talk, the T disappears. 
I'm going to tell you a little bit about my TEDx Houston talk. I woke up the morning after I gave that talk. So that talk. Um, what else? With the worst vulnerability hangover of my life. And I actually didn't leave my house for about three days. Okay, for about three days, we've got linking linking on there. We've also got some um, two word conversations with uh, two word conversations, two word combinations with and. So, for example, and I, and I actually, which is quite conversational. The first time I left was to meet a friend for lunch. And when I walked in, she was already at the table, and I sat down, and she said, God, you look like hell. I said, thanks. Um, I feel really, I, I'm, I'm not functioning. And she said, what's going on? This section is a little different as well, because here she's remembering a conversation that she had with a friend, so she's kind of adding in the conversational features. So she remembers that she repeated herself, I'm, I'm, so normally in a talk you wouldn't repeat yourself, but she's remembering, you know, how she spoke in the conversation with the friend when she was feeling vulnerable. And then she goes back into the monologue academic style. And I said, I just told 500 people so she's speaking much more slowly. Here she's making a huge pause. That I became a researcher to avoid vulnerability and that when being vulnerable emerged from my data as absolutely essential. So we had another huge pause here between the two sections and again this the kind of slow careful delivery. To wholehearted living, I told these 500 people that I had a breakdown. I had a slide that said break Okay, and then again, we've got some, we have got, of course, linking, as we normally do, that I had a breakdown, she, she does link that together, but we can see that she is, generally speaking, a lot more slowly, a lot more carefully, with big pauses between the sections, again, not because she doesn't know what she's going to say, but because she's prepared it and planned it really carefully to make maximum impact on the audience so they retain the message. So, that is typical of... Uh, a TED talk, even though, like I say, we still have the connected feech speech features in there. And that's why you're going to find a TED talk much easier to understand than spontaneous um, speech between two natives. Right, speaking of that, we're going to go over to our next video with Brene Brown, which is fairly different to the TED talk. It's an interview with um, Marie Forleo, who is a famous online business guru who interviews lots of famous people. Um, and obviously this is completely different. For a start, it's not a monologue, it's an interaction, an interaction between two people, two people who know each other and know each other well, and you're going to see um, that that's the case um, in the way they interact with each other. Brene! Ah! Hi! Hi! Oh my gosh! Oh. So it starts off with them shrieking and kissing. Um, I love you so much. We I love you too. Telling each other that they, they love each other. So it's obviously pretty different to the formal academic style in the TED talk. It's a real interaction between two friends. We've wanted to do this, I feel like, for so long. And I'm so appreciative that you said, girl, can you come to Texas? Did you go to Bucky's? Okay, and then the, um, so, you know, Marie does the little um, introduction. Um, and then Brene asks this question at 1 minute 40, which seems a bit strange. She says, did you go to Bucky's? Now, I don't know what Bucky's is. We're going to discover it. And she reduces her question down to did ya? Did ya? So really um, informal conversational um, pronunciation. Let me try and play it again from here. That you said, girl, can you come to Texas? Did you go to Bucky's? <laughs> okay, so based on Marie's what Marie said before um, about coming to Texas, we can assume Bucky's is something um, particular in Texas. So we'll see. So you I guys, made her come just. I made her come just for the ice house and the gas station. 
Okay, so then in the next part we've got um, uh, Brene who repeats herself, and I made her come, and I made her come. Um, so typical spontaneous um, speech. We're going to go and skip on a bit so you can see what Bucky's actually is, if I can get it to the right bit. Which tabs in there. So as an aside, come to Texas, driving around last night, I have never seen a gas station so big <laughs> in my life. So Bucky's is a gigantic gas station um, that you find in the state of Texas in the U.S. Hey, and I heard about Bucky's, and I go into Bucky's, and I was like, "This is a wonderland of goodness." Yeah, yeah. It's like tires, raincoats, fudge, squeaky pigs. Squeaky pig. Uh, you got it. And then, okay, so um, uh, Brene is is you know agreeing and supporting Marie in what she's saying, giving more examples of what you. Of what you can get in Bucky's. Um, at two minutes fourteen, uh, she used the expression "you got it, you got it." That's a really informal um, expression that we would use in conversation to to show agreement. Very American. Um, definitely not what she would say in a in a in a TED talk. And the one thing which I will show you guys, we might actually cut it in, is a. Uh is this beautiful stone piece where you put a wine bottle on top and then it's a spigot. And I was like, that's the kind of gift a girl like me needs. You gotta trust Bucky. <laughs> you gotta trust Bucky. Okay, um, I like what um, Brene says next. You gotta trust Bucky's. So, um, you know, she's reducing you've got to down to you gotta. Um, and it's another expression to show agreement with what her conversation partner is saying because, of course, this is an interaction. You want to show that you're listening. You want to develop and build on the conversation. All right, I'm just gonna rewind slightly. Or like me needs. You gotta trust Bucky. <laughs> you gotta trust Bucky. My husband and I are always waiting to see if it goes public. I'm like. <laughs> right, now, the speed at which she speaks here, if we compare that to the TED talk, I mean, it's just, it's so fast, so relaxed, so joined together. Um, I'm gonna play it again so you can try and catch it. So, okay, getting to the real, real stuff. I wanna start. Ooh. Just skipped ahead. Sorry. Or like me needs. You gotta trust Bucky. <laughs> you gotta trust Bucky. My husband and I are always waiting to see if it goes public. I'm like, <laughs> today we're buying it. Okay, so what she says here is, my husband and I are always waiting to see if it goes public. Um, so what she means is, um, they're waiting to see if the uh, if Bucky's. Um, becomes public, goes on the stock market so that they can buy shares in the company because they think it's such an amazing gas station. Um, so there's a lot going on here. Uh, she um, There's a lot of linking, shrinking. So my husband and I, that all joins together. We're always, so the, the R, the, the verb B is reduced right down to R. Always is waiting, so that joins together as well. Uh, to see if it see if it also joins together. Or like me needs. You gotta trust Bucky. <laughs> you gotta trust Bucky. My husband and I are always waiting to see if it goes public. I'm like, <laughs> today we're buying it. Okay, and also in this next section, she doesn't complete it, her sentence. She says, "I'm like the day we're buying in." Um, so that's short for the day. By here, here she means by just saying the day, she means the day it goes public, when it goes public. She doesn't need to speak in full sentences here because she's just interacting normally with a friend. We we know from what she said that she's going to, that she would like to buy shares if ever Bucky's goes public. In a TED talk, you'd have to be a lot more explicit about what you mean. You can't rely on shared information between two friends as you would in conversation. You obviously can't, in a TED talk, give a, an incomplete sentence. Nobody will understand what you what you mean. Wine bottle on top and then it's a spigot. And I was like, that's the kind of gift a girl like me needs. You gotta trust Bucky. <laughs> you gotta trust Bucky. My husband and I are always waiting to see if it goes public. I'm like, <laughs> today we're buying it. Okay, there we go again. I'm like, the day we're buying in. Okay, this sort of incomplete sentence. But we understand what she means because we are watching two people interacting and we've seen the shared context. Um, right, if you watch the whole interview, you might notice that there are some sections where Brene talks more like she does in her TED Talks. And this is because in the interview, she's talking about her new book, Brave the Wilderness. And I think that... Um, 
she's had lots of interviews about this book. She's prepared for the questions she's going to get and she's prepared the answers she's going to give. So when she's talking about the book or about her work, usually it's a bit less spontaneous and more like a TED talk because these sections have been prepared or rehearsed. So I'll just show you an example that I thought was interesting from seven minutes on, if I can get to, to it. We can talk about with each other. So braving is the acronym we use. B is boundaries. You set boundaries. When you don't know what they are, you ask. You're clear about what's okay and not okay, which is, as you know, so hard for people. Yeah. It, boundaries are really hard. Reliability is the R. You do what you say and you say what you do. The big hard thing about re reliability is you're not hustling for worthiness, so you're not completely over committing. So here, you know, we can tell that she's planned what she's going to say. She explains her acronym BRAVING so she knows what each letter corresponds to, obviously, because she invented that idea. Um, she's speaking still fairly quickly, but a bit more carefully. And um, it's not as spontaneous as before. She's not repeating herself. She's not using filler expressions like you know. There are even some pauses which I think are a bit more calculated. So you will notice during this interview that you know she switches from the very informal conversational style um, when she's just chatting with Marie about you know Texas or things like that, um, things they have in common, and then when she switches to really focusing on talking about the book where she's going to sound more like she does in a TED talk. So that is actually a really interesting thing that you can do. You can watch a TED speaker and then you can go and have a look around on Google, on YouTube to find interviews with that same speaker and kind of notice how they sound um, when they're speaking more informally or spontaneously in an interview compared to their TED talk and note down, you know, what you notice. But the main things are going to be, you know, in the TED talk, they are using pauses for effect, they have planned everything they're going to say, so you're not going to hear any disfluency features like repetitions, filler phrases, pauses to reflect on what to say, as opposed to pauses for impact, like in the speech. Um, and then, of course, in more spontaneous interactions, you're going to hear all of these things, and of course, the delivery and the speed of the speech is going to be a lot quicker and if that's what you struggle with as most people do then you're better off listening to resources where you hear people speaking spontaneously so things like um, podcasts tv series to a certain extent um, but certainly podcasts um, interviews um, any other kind of spontaneous um, uh, speech that you can that you can get hold of and youtube is a great is a great resource for that okay thanks very much for watching and i'll see you again soon